Hey guys, welcome to the Writer's Journey. Um, I'm your host, Lauren Moore, and with me is Kayleen Williams, Josh Hayes, and Ellen the Cutter Campbell. We are having like a mini family reunion today, and we're just gonna have like editors. You wanna ask the authors any questions you got, authors, ask the, the editors questions you got, and we'll just kind of go at it. Um, so first off, how's everyone doing? Phenomenal. It's good to see your faces. I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm ready for the weekend. I'm also ready for the summertime because it's like two weeks away from boat season. But I'm super depressed because that weekend is supposed to rain like every every day of the weekend. And I'm like, no, no, that's the that's gonna really start starting out the summer on a bad note. But I'm excited for it anyway. When's that keystroke retreat happening at the Hayes household? <laughs> Whenever you guys want to come down, I'm down. <laughs> and Ellen's bringing chili, right? I'll bring chili. Oh, yes. chili. Nice. <laughs> Kayleen, how are you doing? I'm surviving. Oh. Um, I've had a head cold all week, so <sighs> I've been going at like half capacity. And then when I, when I feel like almost better, I try and do all the things that I normally do. And then yes. uh, the night comes and my body's like, ha ha, you fool. <laughs> and then I just feel like crap. And it's a never ending cycle. Oh, so, well, so it's been fun. At least you you crawled out of bed, crawled out of the covers to join us today. Well, I'm still you know I'm still getting stuff done because like yeah. if I stop, there's no one else to do it for me. So like oh. yesterday, <laughs> I cleaned the pool, did like three loads of laundry, and finished some edits. Did a proof or something? I don't know. Anyway, I'm still getting <laughs> stuff done because that's what you got to do. <laughs> and how are you, Ellen? Oh, fine. All things considered. Working, house? living. My house is is growing, so that's something. Which I keep awesome. sending messages with saying things like, yeah, this crack, what is this crack? I'm sure they're tired of me by now. <laughs> you know. That means it'll get done faster. Hopefully, yeah. But now that now that they've actually started, it is moving pretty fast. Or you don't well, I don't know. I think two days a week. They should have been done last month as far as I'm concerned. So it can't be fast enough. Yeah, particularly with the lumber prices and gas prices on the rise. Well, that's and, their problem. I signed the contract. <laughs> and Hi who is this? Papa Chuck. Sorry Welcome about that. Foray. I I actually dozed off in one of my office chairs over here. That <laughs> that's amazing. <brilliant. laughs> I got my second uh, Moderna shot yesterday, and hmm. I kind I kind of feel like slow roasted crap at the moment. So. Uh, I just kind of. I'm with you there, Papa. I'm here now. I'm here now. Yes. All right. What are we doing? Well, are we we're. Hi. Uh, we, are we are live. live. <laughs> yeah. Hi, world. Hi, internet for all time. Yeah. My first question is from the office. The you know epic question. Michael asked Toby. So why are you the way you are? <laughs> Authors, editors, what makes you tick? Why are you the way you are? So do we get to say what we think editors are, are motivated by and sure, or, say what writers are motivated by? Or, or Papa Chuck, you as an author, like, like, why are you the way you are? Oh, anyone Jesus. can answer. You don't all have to answer. Uh, Just anyone who feels it. Um, I had this babysitter. <laughs> I, like in a very meta sense. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I am the way I am because I like telling stories, but this is very meta. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I just have always done it, and it's. Uh, I don't know that it's ingrained in my blood because you could say that pretty much about anything you like doing. Uh, but I don't know. I, uh, I I wander around daydreaming about different things, and sometimes uh, for some reason I feel inclined to write them down for people to read and tell me their opinions about. Um, but other than that, uh, it's, it's not really a, a big, uh, uh, crazy idea. It's just, I like, I like telling stories. It's fun. It's part of who you are. It's a drive to get it out yeah. and share it. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I think for and you're me, good at it. Oh, go ahead. Well, thanks. <laughs> that was all. <laughs> okay. Um, I think for me, uh, I've mentioned before I had a unnecessarily dramatic childhood and I started reading at a really early age. And uh, I, I think for a long time that was just kind of my, my escape as a kid, you know, and um, 
I just, I fell in love with story very early in life. You know, even I can remember, oh gosh, when I was like 10 or 11, you know, and I, I could kind of pick out and, and I'd be reading whatever book and, and I could pick out, you know, oh, this is, this is where the, they get really committed to, to solving the problem and that, you know, and this, oh, this is, this is the big moment. This is, you know. And it just it just kind of came to me, and I don't know if that's because I consume because I mean when I was eight and nine, I was reading Peter Straub and Dean Koontz and you know very early Stephen, Stephen King. <laughs> you Precocious. Know, I, oh yeah, I, I I actually the first Stephen King book I ever read was Salem's Lot, and I actually stole it from my mother's bedside table because she told me I couldn't read it, but I was determined to read it. And that's actually where my middle name came from, is I actually named myself after Stephen King. Whoa. But, uh, yeah, long that story. So but anyway, cool. uh, yeah, I think that, you know, that's just part of it. And then when, when I was, uh, I don't know, I was about that same age, I guess, 11 or 12, uh, me and my best friend decided that we wanted to write our own Hardy Boys style mysteries with him, him and me as the main characters. And we would just pass those little, you know, those little black and white primers back and forth. And I'd write some. That was the only time I've ever collaborated in my life, actually. And he and I'd write some, you know, and it was just, and it just, I mean, it's, it, it was just ingrained in me. It came out naturally. I got, uh, you know, I got, my teachers would notice it and then they got, they sent me to a college at one point to kind of, you know, and I had a, I had a college professor tell me when I was in junior high that I was either precocious or a plagiarist. <laughs> <laughs> and the teacher went off on him but uh yeah i mean i, I you know there i think every writer is going to have a little bit of a different explanation for that but i just know that now if i if i go too long without work and then i my wife will tell me flat out get your ass in there and write something because you're being a dick just go <laughs> So it's just it's the way your it is. therapy. It kind of is. It's very, I mean, it can be, it's, uh, I think it's a really cathartic thing. And it's, I actually, when I was working in psych many, many years ago, I, uh, you know, journaling was something I would encourage my patients to do, Yeah. you know, not, not like on any grand scale, but just, you know, write down what you're feeling that cause a lot of guys would be, be shy about like speaking their experiences. But if I could get them to put it down on paper and let me just read it, they were, they were less shy about it. Hmm. So, you know, it was, uh, it's, it's just something that's always been with me, I guess, just story in general. Yeah. That kind of reminds me of what Bill Patterson was saying last week about writing and therapy, you know, that yeah. when he's struggling with something very difficult and he you know, didn't necessarily know what the solution is, it would end up in his story and he'd kind of write his way through it. Oh yeah. Um, I can definitely see that. Um, all right. Now, so as for my opinion on editors, Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. No, I'm playing. <laughs> no. I do want to, I do want to add, um, I've always had a fascination with the way words work together. So when I was, when I was really young, you know, between eight and 10, um, it's to me, like I'd be reading and it's that music, the words create. I don't know if I'm the only one that feels or senses this, but um, every story kind of like has its own beat, its own texture. And um, some of them are really good. Some mm. of them are really bad, but I loved finding those different textures. And I love, cause I'm also an author. I love being able to create an experiment with those sounds and those textures. And you know, speaking of that, I, I got a question for you. Since you're talking about how you love how words work together. This is a conversation I've had with my family. When, when, when there's a song, I know every song lyric. I, I like the song comes on. I can typically sing along with it unless it's new or from a generation where I just wasn't paying attention. But, and my family's like amazed by that, that I, I can just remember all these song lyrics. But if you play like notes to a song, I'm clueless, but they can all snap that up super quick. Mm -hmm. So do you find yourself focusing more on, on the, 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 the lyrics to a song because they're words as opposed to the music or does that jump out for you too? So I'm, I'm actually both. Like I can, I can hear just the song of it and usually recall the words more often if it's a song that I sing a lot. Um, I can hear the music in my head and sing the words myself. Um, 
And at the same time, like when I'm listening to music, it's simultaneously how the words are um, melding with the music itself. So when there's a song where the words are kind of like off from the music, it bugs me. Mm. Right. <laughs> because I'm like, they're not, they're not meeting. There's something wrong yeah. that happened. Um, but every now and then there's a song that does it really well. And I just find that fascinating. So. You know, it's crazy. I, I don't even hear the words in the music that I listen to. Like, I don't, I can't, if you were to tell me the words of a song, even a song that I know uh, very well, it, you tell me the words and I would not know the name of the song. But if you play the music, like usually in the first couple of notes of music, I can tell you what song it is. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't know the, even songs that I listen to all the time and i'm like i'm trying to learn the words i have to read the words right. and listen to the song at the same time to same. actually remember the words otherwise i'm like i have no idea i just like the beat <laughs> yeah. i can't remember titles for for my life i can't remember people i can't remember titles i can remember i'm chuck like a plot i can remember um like when it comes to like like the songs, if uh, no, I totally lost my thought. You made me cough, and it's gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> the titles, titles are are hard to remember. But titles Caitlin, are I, have, hard. I have a question about um, you and words and the magic and power of words. Is that part of why you went into editing? Like, is that what draws you into editing? Do you think? It yeah, it's probably definitely a big part of that because I mm. get to experience a never ending wealth of all these different voices, and I get to put myself and settle in nice and deep in that voice and kind of like, you know, figure it out and find like where it can, where it can get stronger, maybe where it's weaker and, and help that author, you know, really round out and blossom and create a masterpiece of awesomeness. And then I get to use that in my own writing, <laughs> which is even better. You're like learning from, from the process of editing someone else's work and it's given you ideas for your, your writing too. If you're, if you're not still learning, while you're writing, no matter I mean, if you've written a thousand books, something's wrong. That's just my personal opinion. You're all, all going to be learning. Every single story is different, even from from same author to same author. Each story is a completely different beast. Like I, I can't honestly um, judge my editing between two separate manuscripts because each manuscript has a completely different need. Mm. Um, but, I, I, I just I just had this conversation with Scott a couple of days ago about not learning uh, or not growing as a writer, not not learning new things as a writer. And it came up because we started talking about Tenant, uh, the most recent movie from um, Christopher Nolan. Yeah. And there was a YouTuber that came out and was doing a YouTube video and said a, a lot of critics came out and said um, Tenant was Christopher Nolan's worst film and he hit missed the mark and all this stuff and the guy that was making the video said he didn't think that christopher nolan missed the mark he thought christopher nolan tried something new and it right. didn't work and um that was a it's a growing step you try something and it didn't work and it doesn't necessarily mean uh you failed or you hit the mark it was just trying something new and i think that that's interesting because of where Christopher Nolan is at in his career and his storytelling ability. He could have, he's already proved that he's a great storyteller, like uh, right. with Inception and all these other movies that he's done, you know that he's a good storyteller. And so it, it's obvious that he knows how to do it well. If he just did what he did before using the same processes and stuff, uh, maybe Tenet could have been a better movie. Um, but he didn't, he tried something new. And I think that's interesting. And I think that that says a lot about him as a storyteller Yeah. saying, seeing where he's at in his career and the level of storyteller that he is, uh, that can be applied to everybody. Yeah. Mm. And I, 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 the first time I saw that, I, I recognized pretty much everything you said. And I, I was impressed with the attempt, you know, I, I do think it fell a little short of being cohesive enough to really you know, for people to follow it and to be a big hit and stuff like that. But, but the way he twisted everything around and all that, I, I, I personally, from a creative standpoint, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so Ellen, what makes you tick as an editor? What makes me tick as an editor? 
Yeah. What, what are you all about? Rage. Pure, <laughs> unfettered rage. <laughs> Well, yes and no. I mean, it's sort of rage, but uh, it's because I'm, I'm like Chuck. I started reading. I don't remember not being able to read. So yeah. and and books books were my life for most of my life. I mean, it, well, they still are. So I guess for my entire life, books have been my <laughs> life. But they didn't make me want to write. I just it was more worlds that I had that I owned and I would read books over and over again. And I read really, really fast from a very young age. So I've read a lot of books and I've read a lot of books, a lot of times and nuance. It's about nuance and shading and mm -hmm. what that, and like Kayleen says, how words work together and what, what's the difference between if this word with this word, as opposed to this word with that word. And, and for me, it's about making the words better and stronger and not setting them out crippled and bleeding. You know, hmm. I, I, I just want to fix all the words. <laughs> I, all. I don't want them to be sad. No sad Thank words. Them. That should be no your new uh, your new no logo. Sad no sad words. <laughs> your new motto. No, no pathetic words. No pitiful yeah. words. Yeah, yes. I just and I well, I may know what you're trying to say. If that's not what you said, I'm I'm going to call you on it. Yeah. Just because right. I know what you mean is it doesn't mean that that's what you said. Right. Oh yeah. I find myself pointing out um, at least one of those in every manuscript, highlight it and be like, so this is what I think you meant, but this is what it's actually saying. So I edited it to be what I think I thought you meant. <laughs> that does happen. Yeah. Yeah. Copy yeah. editing's fun when you get to just fix the grammar, fix the spelling, um, fix mixed up words maybe or, or facts, and then just kind of, kind of turn part of your brain off, maybe the creative part and just Enjoy the story, enjoy fixing it up and get it out. But that's my that's my only creative yeah, it's outlet. Fine. But when you've got a manuscript that um, is asking for more of kind of getting your your kind of claws in and, and getting to to um, help develop, develop, develop it more. Yeah. yeah. If you get to like for example a scene where it's like a climactic scene and you've got emotions and but the author is also giving you permission and asking you to kind of help with the prose to make it flow more, to bring out the the emotion, to bring out the clarity, and you get to be a part of that process to make the climactic scene like even more exciting and intense. Like that's a special reward in and of itself. And that's what I see you, Kayleen and, and Ellen doing a lot um, with the editing that I've seen from you guys is you like to get in there to make just every page that much stronger. That, that brings up an interesting point. You're talking about the emotion. I know that when you're writing, you know, like I've, I've said numerous times, I believe that art is the conveyance of an emotion through some medium or another. And so for me as a writer, you know, there are certain feelings I'm trying to catch every time I, I do a certain scene. You know, like I recently wrote a scene where somebody killed somebody for the first time and they didn't mean to. Mm. But there was all of this dealing with that. You know, how, how does that feel for somebody that never thought that would happen to them and, and stuff like that? And I was trying to get those emotions across. How emotional does an editor have to be? Now, I get when you're saying a copy edit is just mechanics. You know, you just fix the machine. But like when you're doing something developmental, do you try to tap into what they were trying to convey emotionally or do you have to be a little more distant from it to pick it apart and, and, you know, polish it up or whatever? No, so you don't have, the distance comes from it not being yours. I mean, if, if they draw you in and you're that emotionally involved, that's a good thing. Even if that means that you have to go back, okay. but the distance is, the distance is there because it's not yours. You didn't write it. It's automatically there. That makes you're sense. always one yeah. step away. That makes so, sense. Okay. In my opinion. Yeah. Well, it for is, me, anyway. It, it depends on also what they've hired you for, too. Like some authors, they don't want that. Like they don't want the the collaboration. Like this is the book that they're happy with. This is the manuscript that they're happy with. And they just want you to kind of find errors. Like, like you know, the copy editing. Mm -hmm. um, but some authors, they're, they're looking for an editor who will be more collaborative. Um, they're looking for you to to add in your two cents or, you know, to help them bring out that emotion. They're looking for more of a collaborative experience, uh, but that's what they're telling you in their email when they set up the project from the start and you kind of get that all figured out. Um, and I, you know, I had a question, what, what do you two authors and Kayleen too, what do you guys, what are you looking for in an editor when you, when you hire one? 
what makes a good editor? What are you looking for? Mm. Um, well, for me, it's to find all the words that I typed in correctly that I thought I typed <laughs> correctly. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's not grammar. That's like if I, I think uh, in the manuscript, he went above this, right? But I actually type about. And when I look at the manuscript, I see above. I don't see about. Right. It's the word but then, that like I think, when you do a spell check or something, it's it still, doesn't catch it. It doesn't catch it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I do that a lot. Uh, Me too, and brother. <laughs> I, I'll even do it when I'm looking. Like I'm, I know that I've already done it, so I'm looking at the sentence, typing it, and I know the word that I want, and I type the word that I don't want, and it, it's it's crazy. Uh, so yeah. I'll, uh, I'm really good at um, overall plot for the most part. Um, I'm really good at overall character arc for the most part. So most of the time when I get an edit, it's just a copy, uh, copy and proof to find the words that I've messed up uh, to find. I, I'm, I'm, I'm horrible with commas. I, I either put too many commas or I don't put enough. Um, I, I never, ever, ever find a good <laughs> middle ground with commas. Yep. I'm um, right there too. The, the thing I, I had one editor tell me I was genetically incapable of properly using commas. <laughs> <laughs> there was just something wrong with my evolution. It just never got to the comma stage. They did a blood test to figure that out. Something I don't know, but I, I made it through an entire English college class and never understood what an Oxford comma was. I don't even know what an Oxford comma is now. I could not tell you what it is. I don't even care. I just put commas where I think it sounds good, <laughs> and then they, the editor fixes it for me later. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I don't know. I it, what I sometimes I think uh, for me looking at uh, newer authors or even a, a there's a really kind of an uh, interesting dynamic that happens with brand new authors and then writers, indie writers predominantly have been at it for a long time. Uh, is brand new authors just take all of the edits and just either go with it or delete them. And uh, some of them learn and some of them don't from the editing process. I really look at edits uh, that aren't strictly grammatical and try to always learn something new from each edit that I get. Um, I, normally what I do is I'll go through and find the comments, look at the comments and see what the comment is about and talking about it. And then I'll f either fix it or that's, uh, you know, like you guys were saying, that's not what he was trying to say. And, and maybe it's, that was on purpose, and so I'll I'll just leave it, uh, and then I'll just highlight all the little commas and letter changes and all that stuff, and and select all. But I've seen a lot of really seasoned authors um, don't learn at all from the edit, and they they don't even care about what the editor has to say, and they don't learn from the editing process. And I think that's it, it's kind of a hard line to to walk. Uh, but I definitely, every manuscript I, I have edited, I, I try to learn at least one or two things and then try to keep those in my mind going forward and try not to make those mistakes the next time. Cause then every editor, every edit should get a little easier to go through. Hmm. Um, but that's just me. That's how I, I go through it. Yeah. I'm kind of like that too before, you know, whenever I, uh, I get done with a, a draft, I, uh, I always do my own rough pass edit. And I mean, I'm, I'm looking for the blatantly obvious stuff that I don't want to waste an editor's time on, you know, obvious misspellings that jump out at you. So I'll go through like the way I do it in Scrivener, every chapter is its own file and I'll just do, you know, a few a day until I'm done with it. And I'll just, the really super obvious stuff I'll take care of. So when I actually send it to an editor, you know, it's a reasonably clean copy. So what I'm, what I typically am looking for is, is sort of a deeper copy edit for like those words that look like they're supposed to be there that are the wrong word. And then things that like, uh, well, you and I worked together on my short story for the, the thing there, Kayleen, you know, it was, it was more like, well, the stuff you're talking about, were you trying to say this? Is this what you meant? Maybe add a character here, you know, just sort of a overall reader impression you know what i'm saying not not like super deep developmental stuff but just it was it an enjoyable experience what would make it a more enjoyable experience in your opinion you know that kind of thing so it's it's not really a beta reader so much as 
just uh, I want to partner up to make it better, you know, mm. and get and, 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 you know, if, if you find something that doesn't work for you, tell me why it doesn't work. Mm. So make a suggestion to me how to fix it, how to, how, what would make it work, you know, and let me consider this right. and decide whether or not I want to do it. Uh, I have worked with editors that not in a while, but, uh, they kind of were under the impression that I was giving them some clay to mold and that if I didn't do what they said, they'd get all butthurt about it. And, uh, you can't get butthurt as an editor. You really well, can't. Well, <laughs> some can. Some can. Because I had a guy in, uh, I think it was California when I was living out there. He read something for me, uh, one of my many rejected things from back in the day. And hmm. he made, I can't remember the details, but he made a suggestion. I'm like, nah, man, I don't want to do that. And he, like, legit got pissed. He's like, well, then why are you even talking to me? You know, everybody talks about sensitive writers, but there's some sensitive editors out there, too, who think that you're just supposed to blindly go along with whatever they say. And and that's not the kind of relationship I think a writer and an editor should have. One of the things I like about the process I use at Athon is they'll they'll hook me up with an editor. And and I've had a couple of different editors. um, And and it actually took me a little while to get to this process, but I used to go through and it used to take me weeks to go through a manuscript, an edited manuscript and and look at everything and and like break it down to its just basic form and try to figure out how much work do I need to. And now I just look at it and go, do I agree with that or not? If it's no, then I just delete it and move on. And I don't even like, I don't think about it at all after that. And then if it is, usually there's a really easy fo- uh, fix to it. I'll make the fix and move on. And I, I used to stress over that. I used to get so irritated. I'm like, and... like, no, that's what I wanted to say. And no, I don't want to change it to that. And I'd argue with the paper going, I am not going to change that. And I'd sit there <laughs> for hours arguing and doing about it. Um, now it's just like, no, don't agree, delete. Um, and what's great about the process with Athon is I – they send it to the editor, the editor sends it to them, they send it to me, I fix it, I send it to them, and it's done. It, it, they have a couple of proofers that look through it or whatever, um, but it's not like a back and forth where I'm, I'm sending mm. it back to the editor for a re... Now, if I like, make huge, big um, changes, like if I make a couple of paragraphs worth of changes, I'll highlight that paragraph and send it back and go, give this a little read, just make sure I didn't mess anything up in that specific couple of paragraphs. Um, but then it's done. It's over with. I don't have to, it's not like a huge back and forth process. Like I've heard, uh, some really m- big horror stories about traditional publishing. Well, they go back like for months doing a, a, a an edit where they'll make edits and they'll send it back and make more edits. And I said, uh, no, I don't even want to look at it when I'm done with it. I don't want to look at it again. Uh, mm. I couldn't imagine going through like four or five rounds of edits. I would just bang my face against the table. Yeah. Yeah, those, guys, yeah, yeah, those tripub guys, man, they they rewrite their books. Yeah, repeatedly, one, a lot of times. One book per author per year. Period. That was the mm. formula for so long. Yep. Yep. And, yeah. Uh, for me, like I agree with both of you. When um, when I, what I'm looking for in my own work from edits, you know, I I don't want the editor to be afraid of being like, "Hey, are you sure this is what you mean?" Or I'm not sure this makes sense. Um, or even one of my characters, his um, persona um, for, actually it was in, in the Mars um, Mose anthology. He had um, a very firm and aggressive persona when, when I first wrote him. And um, uh, Patterson was like, you know, I don't think he would be this aggressive. He's not like a military man. He's, you know, like a a colonist, he would, he would be more concerned and worried. Like that's the kind of feedback I'm personally looking for. Like, does this, does this character's personality even make sense for, you know, maybe the position they're in or for the story itself. Um, And that's also the kind of stuff that I'm looking for when I am editing is, you know, do the characters make sense? Is it working? You know, and I've, I've done an edit where they're just like, don't do any dev. Like, unless it's so blatantly obvious, ignore any dev. And, and I did. And there was yeah. just only, like, a couple, like, really super, like, you can't keep this like this. <laughs> Please fix it. So here's, here's an, and here's an example of what you could do to fix it. Um, so, yeah, it definitely, um, 
be open with your editor in what you're looking yeah. for. I think and, you should always be open to suggestions from hmm. the editor. You know, yeah. always. You know, even if you even if you don't take a one of them, I think you I think it benefits a writer to hear them. Yeah, it's a, it's a new set of eyes, and that's always valuable. I like the word suggestion that you're using. You know, it's not yeah, like, and a, that's what they are in my right. opinion. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then Ellen, Ellen, and Keeling, I know both of you guys put a lot of thought into the comments that you leave on on manuscripts. Oh, um, yes. You're very considerate. You know, when you're thinking through, like, exactly how can I make this better? Um, but you also see it as a suggestion too. Are you looking for the author to kind of? explain themselves like why they're going to say no to your suggestion and like are, are you looking for that kind of feedback from the author or what me I typically mean, no because i won't even remember it later i mean by the time i get back to it i won't i won't remember having written it unless it was something really egregious mm. unless she's editing a short story that i wrote three or four years ago and 90 percent of her awesome. comments were sass Sass, <laughs> yes, roll, roll tide. Roll yeah, tide. exactly. Roll tide. <laughs> I mean, if if they want to, like I always say, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, you know, read through the comments before, like especially if there have been areas in a particular manuscript where it was like some part of a chapter or where I've suggested, hey, maybe you need to flip these chapters. Maybe this one tiny section should really just go at the beginning of this chapter down here. I'll actually give suggestions on how to like blend it because I don't know, I guess I'm just, I can't just leave it at <laughs> that anyway. But you know, if they want to come back and be like, Hey, why? Like you, you made a really nice comment about it, but I don't understand X. Mm -hmm. And we can discuss that. Like I've, I've yeah. also had that happen where I've spent, like I even edit my own comments. So, like I go through, oh, I make comments. And then after I'm done with the manuscript, I call it the long scroll. <laughs> so it's where I take a day or two and I actually scroll the entire manuscript again and I check every single comment that I've made because I also leave myself comments and I want to make sure to get those out um, and make sure that I am still making sense and I'll actually edit them. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so they're yeah more than welcome to come back and chat with me if they want. Would, wouldn't yeah. it be great you're editing somebody's book and you write, write a comment and you don't edit your comment and it makes absolutely no sense and the, the, <laughs> the writer's reading your edits going, what does this comment even mean? And then they edit your comment and send it back. It's like a, like a reverse edit. See, but this so, is why if it's to myself, I put a KW note and I make it bold and red so that when I'm doing the long scroll, it stands out from all the other comments and I delete mm. it. See, I would be a terrible editor because I would always want to be screwing with people in those little comments. You know, I would just put nonsensical shit in there like the gold monkey sings at midnight and just leave it sitting there for him to find. <laughs> I, I know when I've when I've been editing and I'm hungry because I do a lot of analogies. Yeah. So like the there's this, this one, yes. So there's this one <laughs> recent one where I'm like, okay, so this kind of sentence structure isn't bad. It's it's a it's a legit sentence structure, but you've used it so many times, it's like drenching your salad in so much um dr dressing that it's now soup. Mm. Mm, so, mm, like, that, I, yeah. yeah. So, I know when I've been hungry because I start making food analogies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not precious about my suggestions. If a client disagrees, then that's good. That's fine. Sweet. Let's move on to the next page. You know, yeah. If they want to talk about it more, yeah, let's talk about it more. But uh, for the most part, if they don't agree, then that's that's wonderful. It's their book. It's their manuscript. Yeah. They know what's best, and we can. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day, this is your book. I am just here to try and get in your head, in your voice, in the story's plot and the characters, things, and elevate. And if you decide not to do a change that I've suggested, then that is your right. You are the author and the writer. <laughs> Speaking about your books, Kayleen, do you have a book for us to share? I do. And hopefully I can get through this. I'm going to try and force my voice to be normal, but I can't do it for very long because it hurts my vocals. Okay, so. <clears throat> Today's spotlight is on Blue Sun Armada by Scott Moon. Scott War is coming. Duke Euron Marlborough led his mighty house to victory in the Zezner War. The last thing he expected was for his allies to turn on him. With a new civil war brewing, the Duke and his family have one option to survive the King's wrath. 
they must flee. Will they survive the political games of their past? Can they escape their doomed planets and find a new place to thrive before their once great house is destroyed forever? Blue Sun Armada is the first in a new epic space opera set in the far-flung future. Legendary mech battles, intense fleet engagements, and deadly politics all make Blue Sun Armada a magnificent read. Pick your side and buy now to start the fight for survival of doom. Doom. doom and it comes out may 26th so it's a pre-order right now Ta-da! and you messed Yay. up the uh, pronunciation it's pronounced scoot mune and uh scoot that's how so we <laughs> that's a, it's common misconception that it's scott moon but it's actually scoot mune thanks for clarifying that josh Hayes. It's It sounds just like it's spelled. Josh Hayes. Yashi. All right. Well, I see Scott Scott McGlasson in the chat, and he did have a question ahead of time. Uh, he says, in melee or hand-to-hand scenes, I see a lot of blow-by-blow descriptions that go on for a page or more. General opinion on this. I get that it is cinematic, and can be cool at times, but given plot armor in most cases, it definitely feels like less is more should be the rule here once again. Oh, Ellen's got Ellen! Hand up. Yes, it, it yes is more. Uh, it's great. It's cinematic. Leave it in the cinema. I mean, you outline it. You don't have to like go into detail about every breath and every cramp and every twinge and every whatever. Yeah. Give your readers some credit for imagination. Let them build the fight up in their mind instead of what hand holding holding their hands and walking them through it. Yeah, I completely agree. Larry um, Niven. There's, there's one edit that I did where every twist, hand grab, arm move. It was this fight between three different people and. Like they're describing every single twisted here and here, you know, threw him on the ground and all. Yeah, I'm like, okay, first of all, I'm getting lost between guy one, guy two, and main character. And I'm having to work so hard to keep the movements in my head because you're telling me every movement that I'm already like imagining over here. But then I have to back up because you're telling me something else different was happening in that moment. So, yeah, definitely like a. Less is definitely more. Yeah. So I had, uh, so I actually have historically agreed with both of you on, on what you're saying for the less and more. However, uh, over the last few months, I've been listening to uh, a series of books called The Gray Man. And um, I just started book nine. And I've listened to these books back to back to back to back. And it's the first time that I've ever listened to a series all the way straight through and found reasons to just go and listen to the book because they're phenomenal books uh, by Mark Greeny. And he does almost the exact opposite of less is more. And his fight scene, his scenes sometimes can be upwards of probably five to 10,000 words. Um, and they're, wow. they're the, the scene itself is spread over a couple of chapters Um but his description of like the fighting and the movements is on point and it's very descriptive, but it's also extremely fast paced and it's mm. super easy to follow. And this is the first author uh, with the exception of Brandon Sanderson, take a shot um, <laughs> that I have read whose descriptions of a fight scene are extremely easy to follow and because he's writing about a basically a modern day assassin um, and his knowledge of weapons and all this other stuff, it's it's insightful as he's telling the story. So like normally I would have been on your guys' side of less is more and, and on, on the for the average author, I would definitely 100 percent um, uh, agree with you. But if doing it well, like Mark Greeny does, it's it's exceptionally well done and so in the cases of that i would say that's what his audience is looking for um so really yes uh, uh, less is more is predominantly the correct answer but also it depends on the genre and how you're doing it because his thriller stuff is designed for this specific audience that wants to read the fight scene 
Well, yeah. it's also um, like less of what is more, too. Right. Well, and if you're writing like science fiction, you have epic space battles, you're not going to be able to write every action of every space fighter or every battleship or whatever else. So in that instance, I would say yes, less is more. The ships fired 800 missiles, but you don't have to document every single one of them. But if you're doing like a hand-to-hand -hand combat between two exceptionally skilled fighters and you're reading a well-designed choreographed fight, that is cool. Um, and but I would also say if you're having that fight, have that scene do something else as well. If it exposes some kind of plot twist in the book, or it brings in a a new MacGuffin, or or uh, kills off a character, or something like that, have the fight do something other than just being a Jackie Chan fight, because those can yeah. get really boring and and uh, repetitive. So I do I, think there is a very. I do think there's a very like small niche of readership that wants the action. You know, they want the detailed examples of action. They want they want to get as immersed in that. Just like there's a, a niche readership for erotica that wants a lot of sex in books. Right. I think there's a, a niche readership that wants a lot of violence and 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 you know highly detailed descriptions of, of that violence. So it really, like you said, I think it kind of depends on the genre, but overall, absolutely less is more. Most people want to be like, oh, they fight it. Oh, that's a cool move. Oh, okay, then what happened? You know, and that's it. They don't they don't want to hear about every step that's taken and every, you know, thing like that. So right. at the same at the same time, and I'm agreeing with both of both of or the direction is both of you. Um <laughs> at at the same time you know, where is this focus? So like when the author is going in and writing this scene, where is the focus of this fight scene? So a lot of the times when I come across a fight scene that's like depicting every single, you know, arm jab and leg movement and throwing on the ground, you know, it's, it's like I might as well be watching paint dry because there's no emotion in it. I'm not in the character's head. I don't have any new information. I just know that they're throwing punches and he blocked and, you know, but it sounds more like what the one that you were talking about, Josh, there's more involved than just a punch, a step, a swing on the floor rolled with his right arm, you know, sort of a thing. There's, there's a lot more intention right. in the fight scene than just creating a fight scene. Well, so that's, right. that's a big difference. So. And what you're describing, it sounds like something's missing from the prose, not something, well, maybe there might be too much, but you, you've got a lot of action uh, sentences and not a lot of what Kit's pointing to. He, Kit says, I'd be interested in the thought process of the combatants, how they plan to fight. Why did the victor win? Was he faster, stronger, tougher, sneakier, luckier? And you want to show that to your reader not just tell that to the reader, but show that by getting into the character's head, having them reflect, having them plan, also having some storytelling sentences where you're, you know, you're acting as a storyteller and uh, drawing the reader in. Maybe you're using humor. Maybe you're bringing in um, sadness or anger, frustration. You know, there's different kinds of sentences in the prose, and not just simply a play-by-play a, a -play description of every physical movement. Ellen, what are you thinking? I'm thinking that everybody's right and we're all saying the same thing. Tell the story in the fight. Don't don't write a screenplay of how the fight went. Make, right, make well, the story make the fight part of the story. I mean, not just here's a fight and do you know how hard it is to follow the left elbow swung this way and then he tumbled right. over sideways <laughs> and sideways to which side and no, that doesn't work and wait a minute, now he's got three legs and one of the things I think that I like about what Mark Greeny does is he uses the fight to uh, what's the uh, the um, you put your characters in a tree and you set the tree on fire. You're always giving the, con the conflict to your character uh, and upping the ante. And one of the right. things that can get repetitive about fighting is character gets into a fight. He wins. Move on. Character gets into a fight. He wins. Move on. But one of the things that I think is interesting about what Mark Greeny does is almost almost all the fights there is an equal opportunity for him to lose and win and a lot of some of the times he loses and it changes a, almost everything about what he was going to do in the story and makes it m harder for the protagonist to 
move through the story. So he's got to change what he's doing. So he had a plan. I'm going to go this way. He gets into a fight. He loses the fight. And that means all of this that he had planned to do that you saw coming is not, you can't do that anymore. You have to do something yeah. else. And it, and it always ramps up the tension and the conflict instead of just having a fight for the stake, sake of having that fight to show how cool your character is, have the fight and then shift the entire focus of the story somewhere else and doing it intentionally. Um, as one of the things I just watched, um, for all mankind, it's on Apple TV, which I think is does the show a complete disservice because not everybody has Apple TV. Um, but for mankind is a a uh, alternative history. Uh, it's not really a, a hard sci-fi, but it's more hard sci-fi than regular sci-fi. But it's about putting a base on the moon, and and it's in the it starts in. Uh, the 60s and kind of goes through up and up until like I think it the second season ends in 95 but anyway um, the their purposeful writing is so evident that it's crazy and I think it's one of the best slow burn shows ever and they do kind of the exact same thing they'll have a conflict or they'll have a fight and just not it's not for the sake of conflict it builds and continues to build and shifts the focus which I think a lot of newer authors get confused with of having cool action scenes or battle scenes and, and, and conflict. Those are two completely different things mm -hmm. and ramping up the conflict in the story, whether it's through a fight scene or through something that happens in the story, that's what makes stories really good. Right. And, and that's what pushes the reader through. Um, and so I think having relevant conflict in your story, however you present it is key and man for mankind did it exceptionally well. I need, we need to, I, I got to break that down on a video sometime because man, they, the slow burn on that show was crazy. Ridiculous. Chuck, have you seen it? I have not. I, uh, I, I'm committing that to memory at the moment. I'm going to see about some Apple TV because it's yeah, interesting. You guys can do a live on it or something. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I said, I wish right, it was though. on Netflix or something because man, the, yeah. I I think that they really missed the mark putting it on Apple TV because it is phenomenal. Yeah, I think you're right. You shouldn't have, you know, if, if the conflict, the fight, whatever, uh, doesn't really move the story, then it's just fat that needs to be trimmed. Yeah, and um, you know, unless you're writing for that small niche that just wants. You know, some, you know, unless you're right for like John Wick, you know, that's, yes. that's a, that's a bunch of fight scenes strung together by a tiny little thread of story. And that's I it. fell asleep during John Wick. Three. I know. I mean, after a while, it's just kind of like, okay, he's going to get all bloody and eventually win. And blah, blah. Right. You know, so, but again, there's an audience for that. So unless that's what you're trying to write. Absolutely, there should not be a fight scene or a conflict or anything like that that doesn't add to the story. I think Jonathan Mawberry does a really good job of managing his action scenes in his Joe Ledger series. Because those always have some sort of impact that that adds to things, you know. Mm. And uh, I think he's a really good example of writing action scenes. Yeah, so we should look, him up. look yeah. him up and get him back on the show sometime <laughs> um so do you authors have any questions for us editors any questions you've always wanted to ask you've got three right here um, bum, bum, bum. see now i was is... thinking about this and i'm like i don't know if i have a question because i'm both i'd be asking myself questions so i'm depending yeah. on you guys <laughs> why are y'all so mean no I'm kidding. <laughs> <You're> mean? <laughs> what is the what is the most frustrating rookie mistake that you come across Ooh, good question hmm. for for one, newer off one? Oh, eh, you know whatever comes to mind for me it's the same old same old <clears throat> learn your craft learn how to punctuate dialogue don't use stupid stupid action beats don't open chapters with people standing sitting looking watching staring or whatever get get something going yeah um, when yeah, when heroes. all the characters have the same um, miniature action beats, so he nodded, she nodded, he hissed, mm. she hissed, he um, bit his lip, she bit his lip. Um, it's like they all have the same 
form of movement. Like you can have a knotted. Sometimes a knotted is needed, and it's not horribly terrible because you're not, you know, sprinkling it on like paprika. Um, but then, like at some point, like there's like the last three manuscripts I've had. I'm like, okay, stop. Everyone's nodding. Everyone's hissing, or um, everyone's sighing. That's another one. Everyone's ends up sighing. Um, That's a big thing I've been trying. I've, I've had to teach myself not to do is he nodded or she nodded that's and and also uh backing he backed away or knocked back or blown back Heard. those those right those two uh action beats even though sometimes it's not a beat those two things i've i've it's like your crutch words right like you come across and you have so many different things that you write all the time those so those are mine and i have to really yeah. pay attention to that because it's super easy because he nodded seems like it's a really great beat instead of the character saying yes i agree with you you say he nodded because it's because that's what people do they 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 do right. that it's kind of like what we talked about like right at the beginning of the show is is writing dialogue that's accurate or writing dialogue that's fun to read yeah accurate dialogue is horrible because people don't people don't talk well in normal conversation, but Absolutely. people don't want to read stuttering or repeating. You know, there's some people that talk and they repeat themselves five times before they get to the point. Um, but that's not fun dialogue. Uh, same thing with nodding. People nod all the time, or they shrug, or they would, you know, uh, shake their head, or they they. I, I've I when I was writing the third uh, Valor book, I wrote he sniffed or they sniffed because like sometimes oh. somebody will somebody will say something and you're like right like, so, like, <laughs> like, like, like he it's blew a, a breath through his nostrils yeah i have read that in multiple manuscripts <laughs> yeah he blew a breath through his nostrils first of all where else is he blowing the breath why does it have to be the nostrils and i don't care yeah uh, first of all i don't care <laughs> yeah. no, breath is, your breath is not interesting no i would say i forgot what i was going to say i had something to say it was probably pretty good too. Oh, no doubt. It's always no good. Doubt. Oh, if you're gonna use non-standard dialogue tags, and I don't care if you use non-standard dialogue tags, I'm not one of those people who says you can't. I'm just not. Make sure that they're appropriate. Mm. You know, make sure that yeah. they're. Make sure he's not chuckling at a funeral or, you know, whatever. Unless yeah. that's the point. Right. <laughs> right. Make sure Unless, they're appropriate. Yeah. If that's the point, then it's appropriate. Yeah. Right. Make sure they're appropriate. These things we expect from new authors, and especially because Kaylee and I, we've both written, and we've both done these things. Mm -hmm. And we both had Ellen take them out of our manuscripts, too. I'm, so I'm... we've been there. We, we know it. But but if I'm editing with you, and we're doing four books together, and then in the fourth book, you're still doing it, and, and we've gone through this before, it's like, oh, I would really love to see your writing grow, and I'd really love to see you develop as an author, and, and let's get past this. So that, that's more what I'm looking for with authors is that they're growing, you know, audience authors, um, my friends, my clients, all of you guys, myself, right? We want to grow and get better. So that's what I'm really looking for. And um, what helps me keep going as an editor is to see that growth. Yeah, I'm no longer allowed to use the word gaze. <laughs> gaze, gaze, gazing. <laughs> my characters can no longer gaze. He gazed, she gazed. Yeah. No You're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's we the thing did... about new authors and editors, right? Like getting that, you know, don't do this. Uh, you know, it might take one or two books to to get it into their head that you know this is not something that is going to make your manuscript better. These are these things are hurting your words. But that also comes down to style too. There's a, there's some things that authors like for style, and I think yeah. like you guys know this. Uh, figuring out how to make that uh, easy um, negotiation between writer and editor about this. I'm doing this purposely or uh, I'm not doing this purposely. And I, and thank you for your comment and we'll change it and work on it. You know, it's yeah. it, like I you're saying, it's a relationship. Some, I think that's where the value of finding an editor that you work well with and sticking with them matters. Because once they get to know, well, like Josh and I were saying, we, you know, he was talking about uh, being repetitive with, with little words and not noticing. I got the same problem. I'll, 
I'll reuse the same word in a couple of paragraphs over and over again. Looks fine to me. I don't even pick up on it. But I think if an editor works with a writer long enough and vice versa, um, the, the editor is going to learn, okay, these are the things this writer has problems with. So they kind of know what to look for. And on the other side of that coin, the writer will be like, oh, yeah, Kayleen's always dinging me for this. I better not do that again. You know, and I think that's where the growth comes is because you, you develop that relationship and that kind of knowledge of one another's style and whatnot, and, and, and you both get better from it, I think. Yep. Any yep. advice to a new editor, someone maybe looking to start editing or someone who's just who's, who's new at it and they're learning? Any advice for anything, like how to make their business better or make the relationship better or, or work with the manuscript, make that smoother? Yeah, take your weekends. Really take your weekends. Take your vacations. Yeah. And don't work. There there has to you have to set that time aside for yourself. It's not it will kill you to work every day, even if it's just an hour every day. Eventually you're gonna burn out and you're gonna burn out hard. I agree. Um and um when you are blocking out time for edits, if you reasonably think that it will take you five days to do an edit say that it's going to take 10 or eight, you know, something at least a couple days longer than what you think it will take to give yourself, you know, that space of there was a catastrophe today. I'm not going to be able to touch the edits. And that puts me 30 pages behind on that edit, which now puts me behind on getting it back to the author, right. especially if you start stacking edits, you know, it's like you have to finish this one by that date so you can start this next one. You know, you want to have some time in between them to margin for error, breathe. Yeah, margin for error to, to breathe and recoup and, you know, just relax, go play with your dogs, you know, hang out with yeah, family. The Mr. Scott method always throw the cap and it takes longer than it does. Yep. I would say, uh, in from, from my perspective, not being a writer, but having edits done, I would say my. I, I would say two things to be aware of yourself. If you want to be an editor, one, know what your strengths are. Are you good at dev editing or are you get at copy or line or yeah. even proofing? Because if you're not good at dev editing and you're trying to dev edit, you're going to do a disservice to yourself because you're not going to improve the work. You could likely make it worse. Um, and you're going to do a disservice to the author because if you make the story worse then that, reflects more on the author than it does on you but also don't rewrite the book you're you're not you're not a yes there is a relationship there and and if you're doing the work you need to be accurate and and put your touch on the manuscript but your your job is not to rewrite so if you're looking at sentences you're going this is not how i would write it i would write it this, this way, that is not an edit. That is a rewrite. If you look at the sentence that's written and say, this sentence doesn't make any sense and it should be this, that's an edit. But just because you don't like the style or think it should be worded a different way just because you don't have a, like you're, you're personally not vibing with it, that there, those are two distinctions that I think you should make very clearly when you're going in to edit somebody's manuscript. Uh, but that's just me. That's my, my opinion on edits. No, have, you, I, have you editors ever had somebody who expected you to rewrite it for them because they didn't want to put in the work? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've had, I've had manuscripts that were unreadable. Like if you read it out loud, most people would have no idea what, what that sentence had just said and it needed to be rewritten. And it, it does get into ghostwriting, um, the amount of work that it takes to make that sentence legible and understandable and enjoyable. And then we've got, you know, 100,000 words. It takes a lot of time. So, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of projects where <laughs> it, it got into a really, really heavy edit that ended up being more like ghostwriting. Um, the, the author was pleased by the end in most cases. Um, I, I did have one book that was theological, and um, the author was not pleased with my suggestions at the end, <laughs> Miss Theologian. <laughs> um, so you you definitely need to be really clear with the author. You know what are their expectations? What are they looking for? Um, and be you know forthright in those communications before you start the project, and then stick to what the author is asking for while you're doing your edit. Like mm. actually deliver what 
you guys set up in the beginning and discussed and make sure you're kind of honestly, that if they ask for a copy edit, just, you know, it's a copy edit. Um, but make sure they, they ask, know, make sure they know what that is though. And that, that right. the difference. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I've had a lot of authors who ask for a proofread and um, they want to pay a proofreading rate, but the book needs a whole lot more than a proofread because the, you know, the sentence is really hard to understand. Um, that's so not in a that proofread. situation. Would you do the proofread and then give them a note that says, Hey, this is the proofread, but you need all this other stuff too. That's what ought to happen. Right. So the editor should start reading the first couple pages and then go back to the author and explain, Hey, I know we set up and we agreed upon this, but the book needs a whole lot more. That's what ought to happen. But I do know, you know, when I first started editing back in the day and I didn't, know what I was doing so much and maybe I wasn't even working on a contract, you know, I, I didn't have them sign anything, uh, then I would feel bad. You know, we, we agreed on, you know, X amount for this project, um, but I can tell the book needs a whole lot more. Um, well, I'll just go ahead and, and do that work. And then usually the, the author is like, oh, well, thank you. You did you know, such a wonderful job, so much more than I expected. Um, that's great. But it, then it ends up taking like three weeks of your time. And uh, yeah. So especially with, um, with new clients, I I am emphatic on giving them a sample edit. You know, I'm like, please send me page 30 to 32, wherever that falls closest to the beginning of a chapter. You know, give me those, give me those two, two or three pages, and I will go through and apply what I feel. You know, unless they specifically know what they want. Um, and just and do my thing basically you know and i tell them flat out i'm um i am a line and developmental editor you know if you know i don't always apply developmental because it doesn't always need it and i'm like but if i do see something and that which is harder to do in a sample because usually dev stuff it's a little broader um and i'm like and then if this is looks good to you you know then we can proceed on on a full edit. Um, if it's too much, please let me know if I've done something in there that you're like, well, I really didn't want you to touch any of the dialogue because I'm not afraid to touch dialogue. Um, you know, then let me know and I won't touch any of the dialogue. So, but that's, hey, yeah. Hey guys, I got to bounce real quick, but uh, it was really good being on the show and uh, I you. love having conversations like this. Yes. Thanks for joining us, Josh. Good to see I'll, you again. I'll listen to the rest of the show once I hop off. Ah. Later, brother. So yeah. I just realized it's a little after after the, the hour, um, but we did have a, a question earlier on. And it is a question that we have actually discussed on both shows quite a lot. Um, but this can also apply to, like, you know, finding an editing author relationship. Um, Keith Taylor had asked, um, wonders how writers find and work with other writers mm. for collaborating together. Um, but I also feel like, you know, the right editor, you're also kind of collaborating with them. Um, so your, your guys' thoughts on that. I don't want, I don't want him to feel like we ignored him. I, I think the guy that could best answer that just signed out. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've never collaborated. I, I don't, I, from what I know from the stories Josh and Scott have told me, um, Really, it's just, you know, they got in with the community and they talked to people and they talked about ideas and things like that. And they just found somebody they kind of clicked with and and they went for it, you know. And I think the I think that's probably the best advice. Just put yourself out there and, and, uh, and you know, find people that seem like minded that you think you can work with and give it a shot. You know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I don't think you can be so timid about it that you pass up opportunities because you're afraid this person might not be perfect or whatever. But it, it, at the end of the day, I think it's just about putting yourself out there and letting people know that you're willing to collaborate. Yeah. Put a post in the keystroke group, explain what you're looking for, what kind of project you're thinking of doing, or maybe um, what you're looking for in the, the partnership, like someone to write with me or someone to give me feedback on my words or, or whatever it is. And then I'd say call them or video chat, um, but you can spend a lot of time, you know, DMing them back and forth, but nothing gets that communication as quick as actually like, talking to the person. Um, 
and I know us millennials, we don't really like phone calls that much, but um, get over it. <laughs> it really, it really that, that's what it helps me so much with my time to actually just give someone a call and then stressing about text and stuff. And yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, you know, once you've, you know, you've chatted with this person, um, maybe you've read a couple of their work to even know like if your voices are going to mesh. Um, you also need to be very upfront about um, like who's doing who's doing what, you know, who owns the IP, um, who is going to be ensuring that the files are correct and being uploaded, who's going to be uploading them, who's going to be taking care of the covers. You have to think of everything you would do for a publication and then literally collaborate that with someone else and make sure that like someone has to have the final word. Like you can't just keep passing the manuscript back and forth for forever. Someone has to be the one to say, it is done and we shall publish. And then it's done and you publish. Um, also, um, I know 20 Books has, I believe they have a thread for um, finding collaborators. I, I don't know if it's still there, but I know I've seen it at some point. So that's another place you could look to. But yeah, definitely on Keystroke because, you know, that's us. That's what that's what we're doing. That's what we um, do, y'all. And yeah, at the end of the day, you know, between authors and editors, be honest about yourself, about your work, and about your expectations. You know, if you if you don't want, you know, someone to go in and flip your sentences around or switch paragraph, let the editor know that. Um, if you're an editor and you only do copy and you would never touch dev in your life you know, be honest about that. It is okay. When we're at the last 20 books conference and um, an author came up to me and they're like, oh, I hear you're an editor. I really need a copy edit. And I'm like, I do not specifically do copy. You're going to need to talk to Lauren or Ellen for that. I can rock your socks off with wine or dev though. <laughs> um, but I am getting better. Huh? Anyway, so yeah. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Papa Chuck. Thank you, Josh. My pleasure. Uh, for joining and Ellen joining us on this Friday afternoon. I am going to go and lay back down and drink some more water and tea. And yeah, be sure to check us out next week. We've got we've got a full schedule for the next month. Um, I don't know who's next week though. Rhett but... and Scott from Athon Books. And then the week after we have uh, and Richard Scott Fox. And Rhett and Steve. Rhett and Steve, yeah. Oh. Yep, oh. sorry. And the week after oh. we have uh, Richard Fox and David Weber. So. Oh, yeah. So it's going to be fun. So be sure to come check us out next time. We're going to talk about more reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums. <laughs>